But tonight's topic, my loved ones, is the slayed lamb of revelation. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come out tonight again and to continue to study your word as we started last night. Tonight is night number two, Father, and we have many, many people that have come out tonight, Father, that were not here yesterday, and we thank you for that. And we just ask that we continue to study. We ask so, uh, especially that your Holy Spirit can guide us and strengthen us so that we not may be able to understand your word, but that we may be able to live by it. Thank you for this blessing, Father, and we ask and beg these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Who says amen? amen? So if you were not here last night, yesterday we started with two questions. Two main questions. The first question that we asked last night is, how can evil exist if God is all-loving and all-powerful, right? People ask themselves the question all the time. How, where, why with all pain and suffering, where is God? Why is, what is God doing, right? And we broke that down. And we notice that the problem is not God, the problem is us. We are the problem, right? We are the one that commit atrocities that are unjust, that kill, that murder, that rape. We are the ones, my loved ones. So the problem is not what's the problem with God. The problem is the problem is with us, right? We have been infected with a virus known as selfishness. And so we saw that God did not create this virus. God did not create the problem, but God created an interesting being called... Lucifer, right? Lucifer, right? This amazing, we studied yesterday, the most amazing, the most powerful, most intelligent, most beautiful creature ever created of all God's created beings was Lucifer. He doesn't look that pretty there because by then he became the devil, right? He became the accuser, the adversary of God. And we studied yesterday that sin, selfishness began in him, right? The iniquity or the mystery of iniquity. How has it happened? We saw that this being that was placed at the highest position for any created being, he was not content with that position. He wanted more, right? He wanted to be God. He wanted to the worship of God. He wanted the power of God. He wanted to take God's government. And we saw that there was this great battle in heaven and Lucifer and his angels were kicked out of heaven, right? But then what happened? That rebellion continued here on earth, right? That rebellion, sadly, we studied yesterday, we began to study, that that rebellion was brought here on earth, and that's how we find ourselves in this problem. Now, let's gonna, tonight we're going to answer the second question that we had from yesterday. And what's the second question? How will God solve the problem of evil and sin without what? Why is this? Because if you were not here last night, there's an issue. A main issue, and the problem is this, that the thing that God loves most is his created beings, right? You and me. But the thing that God hates most is what? Sin, right? And what's the problem? That those two things are joined in us. Now, the Bible says that God is going to put an end to sin, amen? He's going to put an end to, to this world of pain and suffering and torch. He's going to put an end to it, right? But the problem is that the selfishness and this problem resides in you and me. So what does God have to do before he destroys sin and evil? What does he have to do? He has to separate us from evil. He has to separate us from selfishness. Are you following me? Before, because if he were to destroy it, then we would all be what? We'd all be destroyed. Why? Because we all have this virus, right, from this fallen nature, this selfishness, and God has to do what? He has to cleanse us from that selfish nature before he is able to destroy sin and put an end to this world of pain and suffering. Who says amen for that? Amen. amen? And so the question is, how is God going to solve this problem of sin and suffering without destroying us? And for that, I want you to go with me to Revelation chapter 14. Go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, if you did not bring your Bibles today, uh, and it's your first time, don't worry. You can bring it tomorrow. I don't know, do you have other, other Bibles in the pews? There are? Praise the Lord. Right? If you do not have, a, if you just forgot your Bible, then you can bring it tomorrow. If not, if you don't have a Bible, period, then please let us know and we will gladly bring a Bible for you. Revelation chapter 14, I want you to join me there. Everybody there? And we're going to start on verse number 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 6. And it says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Notice that there is an everlasting gospel. The gospel is everlasting. And this everlasting gospel shall be preached to who? To the whole 
world before the end is going to come. Now, to understand this everlasting gospel, go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, please. Revelation chapter 5. And tell me when you're there. And it says in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 6. Watch this. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and in the, in the, of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a what? A lamb as though it had been slayed, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Here in Revelation chapter 5, it talks about this lamb that has been slayed or slaughtered and it has seven horns and seven eyes. And you're probably thinking, whoa, what is all this? Remember last night we talked about that in Revelation, in the apocalyptical literature, which is Daniel and Revelation, there's a lot of symbolisms, right? And so sadly, because we only have two weeks, I'm not able to study this chapter with you. I have a whole presentation on Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. Fascinating stuff. So because I'm not able to pre I don't have time for these two weeks to do it. I remind you that you can give me your email, and if you give me your email, I will send you the information. Amen? I will send you the whole study on it. It's an amazing study, Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. I want to send that to you, so you need to give me your email. If you gave me your email yesterday and you did not, did anybody receive their email already? Raise your hand if you received your email. There you go. There are some people that received it. Praise the Lord. If you did not for some reason, it's because it was kicked back. I need you, please, to give your email to me or my wife. Don't write it on a piece of paper and just throw it on the table. We need to verify it because sometimes the numbers and the letters, and then it just kicks back and, and, and it, it takes a lot of time. Please give it to me in person so I can uh, revise it or my wife who is at registration so that we can look at the numbers and letters and confirm it so that we don't have to go back and forth. So if you did not receive it, please give us your email again. Is everybody with me? Amen? Amen. Now, it says here that this lamb was slain. Now, that's an interesting concept. Let's go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. I want to show you where this lamb appears again. They mentioned the lamb. Revelation chapter 13. Remember, we're, lo we're looking, we're studying the everlasting gospel, and we're seeing that the everlasting gospel is linked to this lamb. Revelation chapter 13, we're going to go to verse number 8. Everybody there? And it says, And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. This is talking about the beast or the antichrist, whose names have not been written where? In the book of life of the Lamb, slain from where? From the foundation of the world. So here we have this lamb at Gensen. It tells us it's slain. It also tells us that the lamb has a book of life, right? And so those whose names are not written in the book of life, it says there, are going to worship the beast. Raise your hand if you want to worship the beast. Nobody. So that means that to not worship the beast, we have to have our names where? Written in the book of life. So the question is, how do I get my name written in the book of life? Come on Friday, okay? That's the topic on Friday, the book of life. Amen? So today we're going to focus in on the Lamb. And the Lamb, it says, was slain from where? From the foundation of the? That means that to understand what is, what is going on with this Lamb in Revelation, this everlasting gospel, we need to go back to the foundation of the world or we need to go back to Genesis, right? And so maybe you're here tonight and you say, wait a minute, I was invited to a prophecy seminar on Revelation. And why are we studying the book of Genesis? Because my loved one's Genesis, Revelation talks about the end and everything that is going to uh, happen. And when God finishes with all of this, but to be able to understand the end, we need to go back to the... Now, I didn't go to Genesis. The by Revelation took me to Genesis. It says that slam was slain from the foundation of the world. So yesterday, if you did not come here yesterday, we talked about Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 says that when God created everything, everything was what? Perfect. There was no sin, no pain, no suffering, no murder, no wars, no suicide, no rape. Nothing that we see in this, in this um, perverted and distorted earth that we live on. None of it was happening. And God created everything and everything was just perfect in the beginning. And among that perfection, God created something very interesting. Go with me please to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Among the perfection, God created something very interesting. Genesis chapter 2. Second, that's the first book of the Bible, second chapter. Is everybody where? And we're going to start on verse number 15. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Amen? It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of what? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So God amongst the perfection, everything was marvelous and wonderful, God put a test of loyalty in the Garden of Eden. One simple test. We talked about this last night. It's not a difficult test. It's a very simple test. Why is it simple? Because the earth was covered with millions and millions of trees. And God said, listen, you're going to show your loyalty to me. I'm going to put a test of loyalty to you. And this one tree, I don't want you to eat of it. That tree belongs to me. Don't touch it. Right? It's not a difficult test. It would be a difficult one if there was only two trees. Because then you'd be eating off of the same tree every day. You'd be wondering, I wonder what that tree tastes like. Right? That's a very simple test. To be loyalty. Now, who remembers what did I compare this tree to last night? Does anybody remember what I compared that tree to last night? Oh, you don't remember. <laughs> a voting... A voting booth, right? That was a voting booth. That's what the tree was. The tree was a voting booth. Basically, if Adam and Eve did not eat off of that tree, whose government were they voting for? God. They would have kept the earth under the jurisdiction of the kingdom of God. But if they ate off of the tree, then whose government were they voting for? For the enemies, right? We saw that debate, that political debate that happened in heaven. Remember, this great war does not have to do with strength and power. Because God is all-powerful. And so if God were to fight with the devil, it would be an easy fight. This is not a battle of strength. This is a battle of ideas, right? Of concepts is what we're looking at. And this political battle of ideas that is happening, the devil saying God is not just, God is not fair, God does not love you, God is selfish, God doesn't want your best interest. Don't follow him, follow me. That's what the devil did when we studied last night. He started to accuse and attack God. And what did God do? He destroyed him in the moment. No, he didn't. Right? Because by destroying him, you do not solve anything. You just make it worse. God had to let the devil then carry out his plan so that everybody can see what the consequences would happen of choosing to disobey God and following the enemy. Right? And so that's what, sadly, that's what we're seeing in this great war that we are part of. And so now we see that God, because of what happened with Lucifer, God put a simple test and he said, The day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? You shall surely die. Now, did they eat of it? Yes. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We didn't, get, we didn't get there. We just stopped in the first couple of verses. We stopped in um, chapter 4. Genesis chapter 3. Who's there? And it says in verse number 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good. We're in Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband who her and ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed what? Fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the what? Among the trees. Notice, my loved ones, that it says in Genesis chapter 2 that Adam and Eve were naked, but they were not aware of their nakedness. Guess why? They were not aware of their nakedness because they were covered with the glory of God. Adam and Eve lived in the very pure presence, holy, sublime presence of God. Amen? And so they are not aware because they were covered by his glory. But it says here that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, what happened? They knew that they were? What happened? Very simple. We talked about this last night. By disobeying God, what does God do when you choose to disobey his word? He steps aside, right? He respects your decision and he lets you go your own path. But we also said that when you choose to disobey, to willfully disobey God, he's going to step aside. But there are three things that step aside with him, which are what? His blessings, his protection, and life itself we're going to see next week. Are you following me? And so God steps aside. You know why he stepped aside? To not destroy Adam and Eve. Because, because Adam and Eve had been infected with the virus of selfishness, and the Bible teaches that God, the presence and the glory of God, is a consuming fire. 
There can be nothing impure in the presence of God. God steps aside to not destroy them. Nobody said amen. And by stepping aside, sadly, his glory stepped aside. And guess what? They recognized that they were naked. And so Adam and Eve recognized that they're naked. And what did they do to solve the problem of their nakedness? They did what? They sewed fig leaves, right? They sewed or they tried to cover their own nakedness. Now, did it work? No. It says very clearly here that when God reappeared, when they heard the voice of God, of course, he has to come with his glory veiled, as he does throughout the Bible, to not destroy them. And they heard God coming, and God said what? Look at what it says in verse number 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, what? Now, did God know where they were? Of course he did. What is he doing? It's an investigative judgment. He's, he's finding out. He knows what they are, but he wants them to confess. It says, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, I don't know if you caught that, but that makes no sense at all. It says, when they disobeyed God, his glory stepped aside, and they realized they were naked, and they made fig trees, and they tried to cover their nakedness. But then it says that when God says, where are you? It says they hid themselves from the presence of God. And he says, we hid ourselves because we were naked. I thought they had covered themselves. That doesn't make any sense. You know why? Literally, it doesn't make sense. But spiritually, it says a lot. Because those fig trees, what they represent are the human intent of covering up our own sin, our own nakedness. Nakedness in the Bible is, represents sin. And so Adam and Eve tried to cover their own problem. They tried to find a human solution to it, but did it work? No, because it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that there is nothing hidden to the eyes of God. What does that mean? That means I can come here with my suit, with my tie, I can have my Bible in my hand, and you all think, oh, this guy must be a God of, he's preaching the word of God, and I might be tricking all of you, right? I might be, I'm here all oh, talking the word of God, and then when I leave here, I go and, I, and I'm, and I'm bad-mouthing everybody, I'm, I'm drunk, I'm beating my wife, right? I can trick you, but I can't trick God. God sees all of us for who we are in our own nakedness. Are you catching me? And so here we see this problem, and then God, Adam immediately does what? Adam and Eve immediately. Now in this picture, they're together. I'm sure that they went their separate ways, because if you continue to read the story, they threw each other under the bus, right? They're like, oh no, it's your fault, because you made the woman. And they're all pointing fingers at each other, because that's what sin does. Sin makes us not take responsibility for our own actions, and it makes us point to other people and blame them for our problems. Ah, let me get to, let me get any deeper in that. But <laughs> Now... What was the issue? God said what in Genesis 2.17? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall what? Now, we have a dilemma. Because God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Now, they did not die. And so some people like to get philosophical and say, oh, they started to die spiritually, right? You know, spiritually, and they come up with these interesting themes about why they didn't die. But that's not what the Bible says. Because when God says you shall surely die, the Hebrew word for die is the word muth. Now, I talked to you yesterday. Who is our favorite? Who is our best friend to study the Bible with? A concordance, right? And so the word die, when people I heard all these philosophical implications about what it means to spiritually die, I'm like, what? So I go and I find out what does the word die mean, muth, biblically. And so I look for it and I looked where else it showed up. And guess what? It shows up in Genesis chapter 7, verse 22 and 23 when it talks about the flood. And look at what it says here. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, what? Died. Muth. And every living thing was, which was upon the face of the ground. In other words, when God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. What he was saying is, you shall cease to exist. Because to die means to not have the breath of life anymore. He's saying, the day that you disobey me, the day that you choose to not want me in your life anymore, the day that you decide to walk away from me, that day you will cease to exist no more. And yet, they did not die on that day. Are you following me? It's not some spiritual implications. It was it. 
humanity was going to be done with. Why? Because God is the source of life. And so if you choose to disconnect yourself from God, that is what? That is death. But they did not die on that day. Now what happened? Did God just kind of say, you know what, I'm going to let this one slide. How many of you are parents here? Teachers, any teachers here? Yeah, if you put, if you make a rule in your house or in your classroom and you say, you know what, if you break this rule, these are the consequences, and then that child breaks that rule, and you don't impose the consequences, what happens? You've lost all respect, right? They don't believe you anymore. They're like, oh, she said this was going to happen, or dad or mom said that, or the teacher said that, but I did what I wanted and nothing happens, and they are going to what? They're, you've lost all respect. And to win that respect back, that is uphill battle. God does not do that, my loved ones. God isn't like, you know what? I told you that if you disobeyed me, you were going to die, but I'm going to let this one slide. Let's forget about this for a minute. No. Because the Bible says very clearly in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a human that he should lie. Does he speak and then not act? Does God promise and not fulfill? The question is, why didn't Adam and Eve die on that day when God clearly carries out his justice and his word? And the answer is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Go with me, please. We're asking the question, why didn't they die on that day? Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. God said very clearly, you shall cease to exist on that day. And here's the answer, why they did not die. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Everybody there? Also... For Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of what? And clothed them. What did he make? How did they try to solve the problem of sin? With leaf. Did it work? And God did what? He made tunics of skin. Now I have a question for you. To be able to make skin tunics of skin, what had to happen? Something had to die. I have a question. What animal do you think died in Adam and Eve's place? A lamb. Because <laughs> Genesis chapter 4 says that Abel was a lamb, a, a pastor of sheep. Are you catching this? What is God showing us? God is showing us the covenant of grace. Adam and Eve were supposed to die on that day. And so when God shows up, there they think it's over for them. But what happened? God said what? You are supposed to die today. You are supposed to be finished, distinguished, done with. But I'm going to give humanity a second chance. You can enjoy it. It's okay. It's delicious. I know. I'm going to give humanity a second chance. And there is going to be death because I said there will be death. But the death is not going to fall on you today. It's going to fall on the lamb. Amen? God was showing them the covenant of grace that he was going to make with humanity. Through who? Through the lamb. God was showing them the plan of salvation and telling them, in the same way that you were supposed to die today, this lamb has symbolically died in your place, but this lamb is representing what? The real Lamb of God that was going to come in the future, and He is the one that was going to give humanity a second chance. Can I hear an amen about that? Amen. Woo! And so thanks to this Lamb, the process of reconciliation began. Everybody with me? Why is there need to be reconciliation? Because there has been what? There has been a rupture between the relationship between God and humanity because of what? Sin. And so God, through the Lamb, begins the process of reconciliation with humanity. Amen? But the process does not finish with the Lamb. It starts. Where does the process of reconciliation really happen? In the sanctuary. Amen? Yesterday we talked a little bit about the sanctuary. Today, and for all the rest of this seminar, the sanctuary is the focus of this seminar. And the, and the question is why? Very simple. Because in the sanctuary, God explained or God detailed the plan of salvation. Now, what is the plan of salvation? The plan of salvation is that humanity may dwell against in the presence of divinity. Amen? The reason why humanity and divinity can't dwell together is because of 
Sin. So what does God do in his everlasting gospel, in the plan of salvation? He breaks down how he is going to separate us from sin. Why? Because God is going to once again come to the earth and dwell with those that want to dwell with him. Amen? And so the sanctuary is the blueprint. It's the breakdown. It's the details. It's how God is going to carry out his work of separating us from sin. Praise the Lord for that. Amen? Amen. So let's begin in our study of the sanctuary. Notice what it says in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 and 26, 30. God said to Moses, and let them make me a what? That I may. That should get you excited. Why did God want a sanctuary? Because he wanted to dwell with his children. Amen. God desires to dwell with us. How many here have loved ones that are far off, that are far away, right? I put myself on that list. There are people that I love dearly that are far from me. What would you do to be able to be close to that person that you love? Right? Anything. Right? You miss them. Multiply that feeling by 23,100 multiplied by 23 to the 10th power to the infinite. That's how much God wants to be close to us. But sin has caused a division. So God does what? Through the sanctuary, God wants to do what? He wants to dwell with his children. Amen? He wants to be close with us. Now it continues. And you shall rise up the tabernacle according to its pattern which you were shown on the... Notice that God tells Moses, Moses, I want you to build me a sanctuary because I want to be close to my children and I want them to understand and know how is the sanctuary in heaven. Ooh. So what are the three reasons God told Moses to build him a sanctuary? Very simple. Why did God ask Moses to build him a sanctuary on earth? Number one, he wanted to dwell with his children. Amen. Number two, he wanted to show us a model of the heavenly sanctuary. It was just a pattern. It was a blueprint of the real sanctuary in heaven. And number three, he wanted to teach us what? The plan of salvation. How God was going to solve the problem of sin. Is everybody with me? Now, this is what the sanctuary looked like. The first sanctuary built in the desert. And if you notice, there the sanctuary would be in the center of the town of where God's people were. And they would dwell around the sanctuary. Why? Because in the sanctuary, who was in the sanctuary? God, right? And so God would be in the center of the sanctuary and all God's people would be around it, right? Looking for that source. Now, this would be the sanctuary if you want to break it down a little bit deeper. The sanctuary is divided into three parts. How many parts? Three parts. It's called the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. But also, besides the three places, it has six pieces of furniture, seven feast days, and a number of services. Now, we don't have time, obviously, to talk through all the implications of the sanctuary. We're going to do a flyover today, and during the rest of the week and the rest of the seminar, we're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Amen? Because this is what God is showing us. This is, his, this is his teaching tool to teach us how he is going to solve and save us from sin. Everybody with me? Amen? And so, here you go, you start off when you come into the sanctuary, you go into the outer court, you have two pieces of furniture in the outer court. The first one is known as the laver, that's the first piece of furniture, and the second one is, I'm sorry, the altar of sacrifice, that's it. Altar of sacrifice is the first piece of furniture, that's the first thing that you would find when you come into the sanctuary, right here. You would walk in, and here would be the altar of sacrifice. The second piece of furniture after the altar of sacrifice is known as the laver, right? The laver is where the priests would wash their hands before they went into the sanctuary. Now, how many pieces of furniture do we have so far? Two. Very good. Now, once you pass the outer court, then you move into the second part, which is known as the holy place. And when you go into the holy place, there are three pieces of furniture, right? Let me do it like if I was walking into the sanctuary. So I just passed the altar of sacrifice in the laver, and now I've moved into the holy place. And now I have in my right hand the table of showbread. Then I have right in front of me the altar of incense. And then I have on my left hand the candlestick, right? So how many pieces of furniture do we have now? Three in there, but total five, right? Now, there's an issue. Because when you want to move from the holy place to the next or the last part of the sanctuary, known as the most holy place, there is something that separates it, and it's called a 
a veil. This big veil separated the holy place from the most holy place. Now, the question is, what was the veil there for? Look at what it says in Exodus chapter 26, verse 33. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps, and then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the? The veil shall be what? A divider for you and me between the holy place and the? Now, what was the veil? It was a divider between the holy place and the most holy place. Why do you think it was there? Who was in the most holy place? The presence of God. And so, you know what the veil was for? The veil was to protect us from the presence of God. Because in the presence, the holy presence of God, there can be nothing impure. And so God put a veil to what? To protect us from his glory. Are you catching this? The veil was to protect us from his glory. Now, once you pass the veil, you go into the most holy place. And in the most holy place, you have what? The Ark of the Covenant. Who remembers yesterday what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? You already forgot. Oh, praise the Lord. The throne of God. Amen. The Ark of the Covenant is the representation of the throne of God in where? In heaven, where he reigns and governs all the universe, amen? The throne of God. Now, what was under the throne of God or inside of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten, Ten Commandments. The foundation of God's government are his Ten Commandments, which are holy principles which God uses to reign the universe. Can I hear an amen for that? Amen. Now, notice this very interesting when you look at the six pieces of furniture, look at what type of shape it takes. The shape of the cross. Uh-oh. Now it's getting even more interesting. Amen? The sanctuary is modeled after a cross. Is everybody following me? Amen? Now, we also had, beside the furniture, there were two main services known as the daily service and the yearly service. All right? So the daily service would be done between the outer court, altar of sacrifice, and the holy place. So between these two places, this place would be ministered every day. That's why it was called the daily, right? Then you had a service yearly, which would be carried out in the most holy place. That would only be one day a year. But every other day, this service was being carried out. Today, we're not going to talk about the yearly service. We're going to talk about that next week. Amen? Because it's so important that I have a whole topic just focused on this one service once a year. Now, what would happen every day? Look at what Exodus 29 says. 38 forward. And this is what you shall offer on the altar each day. Two lambs a year continually. One lamb in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer at dusk. So what was the daily service about? Very simple. This is what you would do if you were living in, uh, in the desert in this time period. You would have to come and bring what? A lamb. Now, it, sometimes it's difficult for us to understand what a lamb is because we don't have farms, right? Does anybody here ever live on a farm that, where there were lambs? Yeah, a few of you. Very good. Aren't they cute? Have you ever seen little lambs? They're like the little, little, they're so cute lambs, right? So maybe for us to understand it, we would be able to understand them maybe like a puppy, right? If you ever had dogs and you know how your dog had puppies and they were the babies of the house, right? It happened uh, in my house a number of times and you just wanted to be with your puppy all day and be on the sleep of the puppy and take the puppy everywhere and the puppy was your puppy, right? That's what the lamb would be. The lamb would be the baby of the house. He was born in your house. The lamb would be playing with your children. He's the little baby of the house. So you would have to take that baby lamb and you would have to take him to the sanctuary. And when you took that baby lamb that you loved and cared for, guess what would happen? It says in Leviticus chapter 5 that you would have to put your hands on the head of this lamb and confess your sins. And what would happen is that your sin would symbolically be transferred over to the lamb now the bible says that the payment of sin is death so who was supposed to die in genesis adam and eve right but they didn't die because who died in their place 
a lamb took their place. And so when you would confess your sins over this innocent animal, symbolic would be transferred over to him. And since this lamb now had your sin, now this lamb would pay the price for that sin, which was death. And you know what the priest would tell you? The priest would tell you, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. And at that moment, you would be able to leave the sanctuary because you and your household had your sins forgiven. Amen? You would leave the sanctuary with your conscience clean. Now, understand this, that somebody died in your place. And so, next time you sin, do you think you're going to think about it twice? Oh, yes. Because you recognize and remember that that innocent lamb died in your place. Is everybody following me? Now, that wasn't the end of the service. You would leave to your house, but then what would they do with the lamb? They would take the blood, and they would, they would, they would uh, hold it in a, in, a, in a can. The animal would be slaughtered, would be taken apart, and the body would be placed on the altar of sacrifice. Then the priest would take the blood of the lamb, and he would pass through, right? He would pass through the labor. He would wash his hands, and then he would go into the holy place. And get what the priest would do. He would take the blood of that lamb and he would sprinkle it towards the Ark of the Covenant. Because why? Because the payment of sin is death. And so over there in the most holy place, the blood would be sprinkled towards the most holy place to the Ark of the Covenant. But what happens? The blood does not reach the Ark of the Covenant. Why not? Because of the veil. So for 359 days, the circle was perfect in the Hebrew calendar. 30 days for a month, 360 days. For 359 days, that blood would be accumulating on the veil. Now what happens to blood when it accumulates? It starts to stink. Now we know why there was an altar of incense in front of the veil. The altar of incense was to neutralize the stink of sin. Are you catching me, my loved ones? And so that blood would stay there during the whole calendar year, except guest day what? Except that day where the yearly sacrifice, when all of that would be cleansed. We're not going to talk about that tonight. That's a whole other topic. We'll talk about that during the week. Everybody with me? And so this would happen continually. What was God telling his people? Look at this. God is telling us, my children, I love you so much that I want you to bring me your sin. And I am going to take care of it. I am going to deal with your sin. You bring it to me and I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to throw it here and you go and sin no more. Amen. Are you following me? Now, that's just the beginning. I'm just breaking this down in a, very, uh, in a very fundamental way for those people that maybe are not aware of it. God would temporarily take our sin, which was going to lead us to death, and he would hold on to it so that we what? So that we can live peacefully. Amen? Is everybody with me? And this would happen all year. Now, there were also seven feast days associated with the sanctuary. Seven feast days, the Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, five, the 50 days, Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles. Now, tonight I'm not going to be able to go into detail on this, but I'm going to tell you something about these seven feast days. These seven feast days are seven prophecies. Are seven what? They're time prophecies, right? And I'm going to break that down later on. Today I'm not going to talk about it because we don't have all the time in the world. I'm just, going to, I'm just giving you a little taste. You know when you go to Costco or you go to a supermarket, they give you a little taste like that? I'm just giving you a little taste. I'm teasing you so that you can come back because we're going to talk about this in detail. These are prophecies that were presented. Time prophecies in the sanctuary pointing to a time, a calendar, a prophetic calendar of how God was going to solve the problem of sin. Everybody with me? Now, up to this moment, everything that I've talked to you about is regarding the earthly sanctuary in the Old Covenant. But now, I'm going to show you the prophetic fulfillment of all of these things in the New Covenant. Are you ready? So you're probably sitting here like, okay, why do you tell me all of this, man, this, uh, now, put your seatbelt on because now the roller coaster is going to start. Are you ready? ready? Let's begin with the 
earth, the, the heavenly sanctuary in the new covenant. What's the first thing you needed to do to come to the sanctuary? You needed a, a lamb. You needed a lamb, right? What is the prophetic fulfillment of the lamb? John chapter 1 verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold who? The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Who did that lamb represent, my loved ones? That was Jesus Christ, amen? Jesus was the one that bore our sins, that carried our sins. That's why it says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 forward, Now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a And it says he did what? He touched her hand, and the fever did what? Hmm. And when he even had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and healed what? Now, when Jesus touched Peter's mother, it says the fever dis dis left her. What happened to it? Did it disappear? Did it just evaporate in thin air? Look at what it says. And he healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Sickness in the Bible represents sin. When it says that the Jesus, that her fever left her, it didn't disappear. Jesus took it on himself. He bore our infirmities. He took our sicknesses in the same way that the lamb took the sins of the person that brought it. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came and he took all of the disease. He took all of it on and he bore it on himself. Why? So that we can be reconciled with God. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ doing what? Reconciling the world to himself. Not counting on us our sins or our trespasses. No. He didn't look at us. But what did he do? For he made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Amen? We should have died because of our sins. But the Bible says that the Father said what? No, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit said, we are going to make a plan, the everlasting gospel. And that plan was going to begin with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, Taking our sins and bearing them for on himself. Why? So that you and I can have a second chance to eternal life. Amen? Amen? And so that's why, my loved ones, when we look at the Bible, it says in John chapter 3, verse 16. Go ahead, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave his? Blah, 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 blah. What? Blah, 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 blah. All of you probably know it by heart. It is the most known Bible verse in the whole Bible. Almost every Christian can say it by heart, and yet we have no idea what it means. I'm going to try to show you tonight. What does it mean for God so loved the world that he sacrificed his own son? I'm going to try to explain it to you because the term in Greek for God so loved, that word so in Greek means it is inhumanly impossible to understand. The love of God for humanity is not humanly possible to know. We can glimpse it and start to understand pick at it, but we don't understand it, and I'm going to give you an example. The only example that I know that I can explain what it means that we have no idea really what this verse means. And I'm going to start with an example of an ant farm. Does everybody know what an ant farm is, right? Ant farms are very interesting. Usually scientists, they take these fish tanks and they fill it with dirt, right? And what do they do in these fish tanks, in these uh, ant farms? They put Ants, right? And so you can buy like a little ant farm for your kid. It's really cool, really nice. You know, and they like, the scientists like to study and analyze how ants behave, how they interact, how they sleep, whatever they're doing. That's what scientists like to do. Now, let's, the only way I can, that I am able to understand, part, begin to understand it is how I'm going to share it with you because this is the only way I know how to explain it. So think for a moment that you and I have the power to create ants. And we make our ant farm, and we make our ants. 
Now, if we created those ants, what would those ants be to us? Our children, right? We created them. So imagine waking up every morning and looking, going to your ant farm and seeing your ants. And you're like, oh, look at my ants. Look at how well they behave. Look at how they work together. Look at how much they love each other. Look at how they play. But one day you wake up, and when you go to your ant farm, you notice that there's something wrong. There's an evil ant in there, and he's messing everything up. He's creating chaos. And when you notice, the next day when you wake up, you see that there are other ants that have joined in the rebellion with that evil ant. And everything is being done undone. Now, how are you going to solve this problem? Are you going to go and buy ant spray and spray the whole ant farm? Why not? Because you will kill all the ants. For God so loved us. The only way that you are going to be able to solve the problem that you have in your ant farm, remember, you created your ants, is that you are going to have to become an ant. I already know what you're all thinking. <laughs> I am not going to become an ant. I am a human being. I'm not going to become one of these little ants. Mm -mm. Hold on. I didn't finish. Not only are you have to become an ant to solve this problem, but when you become an ant and you go into your ant farm, you are going to be rejected, tortured, despised, and killed by the ants that you created. Now, if you survive, here's the, the end you will have to stay and live as an ant for the rest of your life. Who signs up? Nobody. I've never given this example, and I've never had one person in their right state of mind say, sign me up for that one. I know what you all thought already. As soon as I told you the first one, let alone the third step, you were saying, I'm not going to become an ant and die. And then if I survive, I'm going to be an ant for the rest of the world and for the rest of eternity. You've got to be crazy. That's exactly why we don't understand the gospel. Why? Because Jesus Christ became an ant. The one that created everything, he did not do what we would do, which be what? I'm not going to do it. He did not do that. He became Creation. The creator became creation to what? To give us a second chance. Are you catching me? You can take Hemingway, Shakespeare, Neruda, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and all of the great writers in all of human history. Put them in a hotel room, in a hotel conference room, for one year and tell them, I need you to write me a love story. And I'm going to give you one year. And by the end of that year, the love story that those writers would come out with would not even begin to hit the soul of the gospel of the Bible. It is the greatest love story ever told. It is not humanly conceivable because I just proved it to you. Nobody would do what God did for us, but God so loves us that he did what? He sent, he sacrificed his own son. Why? So that you and I can have a second chance. Can I hear an amen about that? Woo! Now, that's, we're just starting. All we have is the lamb. We haven't even gotten in the sanctuary yet, my loved ones. Amen? Now, let's go to the sanctuary. What's the first piece of furniture when you go into the sanctuary? It's the, the altar of sacrifice. So, if the lamb represents Jesus, that means that the altar of sacrifice must represent something too, right? Of course it does. What does the altar of sacrifice represent? Luke chapter 23, verse 33 says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him, my loved ones. That's what the altar of sacrifice represents. It represents the, dam, the lamb being killed and slaughtered on our behalf. Is everybody with me, my loved ones? Amen? And that's what we're looking at, my loved ones. The reason why God can forgive you your sins is not because you're pretty, not because you come to church, not because you dress up, not because you put perfume on. No. The only reason God is able to forgive us our sins is because his son died for them on the cross. Amen? That's justification, my loved ones. That's what the Bible is pointing to. It is through his merits. It's through his death. It is through his life that you and me receive forgiveness. Amen? But that's not the only thing that happened on the cross. 
Not only did he carry our sins on the cross to give us a second opportunity, something else happened. What happened? Colossians chapter 2 verse 15. Look at what Paul says. And when he had disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a what? Public spectacle of them triumphing. How do you say that word in English? Triumphing over them on the cross. What? Paul says that Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary was a public spectacle, a victory. How is that possible? He's saying that Christ, when he was on the cross, it was a public spectacle. That phrase, public spectacle, in Greek, is the term that would be used when a king would come back from a battle. How, does, how was a king received in his kingdom when he would come back from a battle victorious? Oh, they would be throwing confetti and balloons, right? And it would be a big party. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that when Christ was on the cross, that it was a public spectacle of what? Of victory. And I'm thinking, how? That is the most humiliating thing that can happen to a human being. Because you not only were standing on the cross beaten, you were naked. Christ, they show him with his little cloth. He did not have any cloth. He was naked. The creator of the universe was nailed to a cross, which is the most humiliating thing that can happen to a human being, and the most torturous thing, naked. And Paul says it was a victory. And my question is, how is that a victory? He explains in Philippians. He says, who Christ, being what? In the very nature of God, that means being divine, not like you and me. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but on the contrary. In other words, he didn't do like you and me did when we heard about the ant. Right? We said, uh-uh, not me. Christ didn't do that. He said he did not consider, well, I'm divine. Right? I'm one with the Father. I'm sitting on the throne of the universe. He did not hold on to his divinity. It says, on the contrary, what did he do? He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, that's us, being made in human likeliness. And not human likeliness like Adam when he was created, fallen human nature. And being found in appearance as a man, he did what? He humbled himself by becoming obedient, obedient to death, and what type of death? So the creator of the universe became a human being. He became obedient to the powers of this earth. And he died the worst type of death on a cross. Why is it that the cross is a sign of victory? It's very simple, my loved ones. Because we talked about last night, the devil was doing what? Accusing God. Oh, God is selfish. God is a dictator. God does not care about you. God does not want the, your interest in hand. God does not care. He is not good. He is corrupt. He is selfish. All of those accusations that the devil had been throwing towards God, guess what? On the cross of Calvary, it's over. The debate is over. Are you following me? All of the rest of the angels and all the rest of the universe saw Jesus on the cross of Calvary, saw the Son of God, and they said, what? Wow! Truly, God is love, my loved ones. Amen? That's why it was a victory, because the character of God had been vindicated on that day through Jesus Christ. Is everybody following me? Amen? And so now what was proven is that the devil was really self-reflecting on himself. Everything that he was saying about God, he's selfish, he's corrupt, he's a liar, he's a murderer. It was really he was talking about himself. And his character was masqueraded, was presented to all its manifestation to the rest of the universe. And the rest of the universe said, "Woo! God truly is love, my loved ones. Amen? The debate is over. And that's why Jesus says, when I am risen up, I shall draw all to me. Amen? Because when you see the love of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you cannot say, but wow, what an amazing God would do something like this. Amen? And I told you yesterday that when you look at the Bible, the Bible is really a court case. It's God's character on trial through the accusations and defamation of the devil. But guess what? The cross of Calvary is evidence A. Amen? 
the defense of God presenting that he is a God of just, that he deserves to reign over the universe because the devil says, God doesn't deserve to reign, I deserve to reign. Now we know who deserves to be on the throne sitting, amen? amen. And so evidence A has been presented, but it's not the only evidence that is going to be presented. Can I hear an amen about that? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, my loved ones, we're only in the first piece of furniture. Amazing. What's the second piece of furniture? The labor. Now, the labor, what was the labor for? The priest, pay attention to this one. The priest had to wash their hands and their feet before they went into the sanctuary. Why? If a priest did not wash his hands and his feet before he would go into the sanctuary, he would be unclean. And if he went into the sanctuary unclean, what would happen to him? He would be destroyed by the presence and the glory of God. Is everybody with me? Now, what does the labor then represent? Jesus Christ took our uncleansiness on himself and he died and went into where? Into the tomb. But guess what happened? Jesus Christ on the third day did what? He resurrected. Amen? But when he resurrected, he did not resurrect with our sins on him anymore. The sins stayed in the tomb. You know why? Because those were not his sins. Those were our sins. And death could not hold him down. Amen? And so Jesus Christ resurrecting, cleansed from the sins of all humanity, represents what? Represents the labor where he has been risen. Hey, who says amen about that? Now, here's where it gets very, very interesting. Because following the pattern of the sanctuary, the lamb dies, he is resurrected, and where is the next place that the, that the priest should go into? The holy place. Now, Jesus dies, he resurrected, so where should he go? Into the holy place, but where? What sanctuary? Not the earthly sanctuary. What happened after Jesus Christ resurrected? He was 40 days with his disciples, and then he did what? He ascended into heaven. Where? Go with me to Revelation chapter 1. Watch this. When you study the book of Revelation, there are a number of problems with people misunderstanding or misinterpreting Revelation. One of those misinterpret one of those principles is that the book of Revelation is located in the sanctuary. If you want to understand the book of Revelation better, then you need to study the sanctuary because the book of Revelation is really Jesus Christ walking through the heavenly sanctuary. Is everybody following me? And I'm going to prove it to you right now. Revelation chapter 1. Who's there? Look at what it says in verse number 9. Revelation chapter 1. I'm sorry. Verse number 10. Everybody there? Look at what John says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Let's jump to verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice of that spoke, who spoke with me, and having turned, I saw what? What did, they, what did he see? Seven golden lampstands. Now I have a question. Where are the seven lampstands? In the holy place. The seven lampstands right there. Let's continue to read. And he says in verse number 13, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded with the chest with a golden band. John sees the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? And he sees him dressed in a very unique way. He is now dressed as a priest. Ooh. He is no longer a lamb. He is now the priest. Amen? And he sees him dressed as the priest, and he's standing among the seven lampstands. Is everybody following me? Standing amongst the seven lampstands. Let's continue to read. Jump with me, please, to verse number uh, 15, 16. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the? I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. 
I have a question. Does this give us a certain time frame to when this vision is happening? Yes. Why? Because Jesus tells John, I was dead and now I am alive. That means that this must have happened when? After his resurrection, after his ascension. Are you following me? And if you notice, know about the book of Revelation, it was written in the year 90. So this could not be happening in the earthly sanctuary. You know why? Because the earthly sanctuary was destroyed in the year 70. This is John seeing Jesus, where? Ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. Can I hear an amen for that? He is ministering, not in an earthly sanctuary, in the heavenly sanctuary. When he ascends, he goes in to the holy place. Can I hear an amen? You want more evidence? Go with me to Revelation chapter 8. I'm going to show you more evidence. Revelation chapter 8. Watch this. More evidence that the book of Revelation is located not on an earthly sanctuary, but in a heavenly sanctuary. Revelation chapter 8. Let's go to verse number 3. Everybody there? Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. Now, there is a golden censer and there is an altar. I have a question. Is there an altar in the holy place that has a censer? Oh, yes, it is. But let's continue to read to, to confirm. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the what? What was, what was in front of the golden altar of incense over here in the most holy place? The throne of God. And it says in verse number four, And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hands. Then the angel, verse five, took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it into heaven. What did the angel do? He took the incense from the altar, he put it in the incense, and he threw it to earth. That means that this cannot be happening in an earthly sanctuary. This is happening in the heavenly sanctuary. Can I hear an amen for that? That's what we're seeing. We're seeing Jesus Christ as the priest walking through the sanctuary in heaven as our high priest. Can I hear an amen? Now, what happens, my loved ones? This is happening. Impossible that this is happening on the earthly sanctuary. I just proved it to you. But what happens after the holy place? In what place do you move into? The most. But there's a problem. There is something that impedes you from going into the holy place, into the most holy place, which is what? The veil. Now, remember, this is not an earthly sanctuary anymore. We've moved into the new covenant in a heavenly sanctuary. Amen? Now, when Jesus Christ died, it says he died at the time of the afternoon sacrifice at 3 o'clock. And it said that the veil ripped in the earthly sanctuary when he died on the cross, from the top to bottom, implying that there is no human intervention in this. That veil ripped. Now remember, the veil was there to what? To protect humanity from the presence of God. And the veil ripped. So the question then is, what does the veil represent? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the most holy, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is what? His flesh. What does the veil represent, my loved ones? The veil represents his flesh. In other words, when Christ died on the cross, the separation between God and humanity was done away with. Christ then has reconciled humanity once again. Because why? That blood would fall on the veil. It never meet, reached the most holy place. The veil was representing the flesh of Christ. What is God saying? Bring me your sins. And he took it on himself. He himself wore our sins. He took our filth. And he wore it on himself. Why? So that when he died, the veil was rep representing and meaning that now we have access again to the throne of God. Now through Jesus Christ, the process of reconciliation has begun, my loved ones, amen? And Christ is now reconciling us again back to God. Look at what it says here in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been what? That's just a theological term for 
forgiven through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who brought us to back in peace with God? It's Jesus Christ who has begun the process of reconciliation. Can I hear an amen for that? Woo! And so now we've passed through the veil. Now Jesus Christ has reconciled, as doing this process of reconciliation. Now we move into the most holy place. And what was in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant. Does the Ark appear in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 11. Go with me, please. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Verse number 19. Watch this. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. I told you the, the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ walking through the heavenly sanctuary. Revelation chapter 11, 19. Everybody there? Amen. Then the temple of God was opened on earth. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Let me put it in the light. Then the temple of God was opened in. And the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Amen. John saw the Ark of the Covenant. Did he really see the Ark of the Covenant as it was here on earth? What did he see? The throne of God. Amen? John saw the throne of God up in heaven. Can I hear an amen for that? And so my question is, what is Jesus Christ doing right now? You see, you ask most Christians, what is Jesus Christ doing right now? And what will they say? Ah, is he just sitting on a, heaven, in a hammock in heaven drinking a virgin piña colada waiting for the time to end and to come back to earth? Uh-uh-uh. The Bible tells us very clearly what Jesus has been doing since he ascended into heaven. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the... Where is Jesus Christ right now, my loved ones? He is at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? And we're going to talk about that later on, what that implies. It means that he is interceding on our behalf. But there's something here that I do not want you to miss. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. I used to be an atheist. For a number of reasons I'll tell you later on in the seminar. I did not believe in God. And one day I came across a book I like I liked to read. And I come across this book, and it was a book on the life of Buddha, Socrates, Aristoteles, and Jesus Christ. Now, I didn't buy it because of Jesus. I bought it because of the other three. I like Greek philosophy and all this philosoph philosophical stuff. And I bought it. And after I finished reading about the first three, I decided to read the last part. You know, I might as well finish the book. And when I came across this book, the book gave the evidence, extra biblical evidence, to the existence of Jesus Christ. And not only that he existed, but that he died the way it's detailed in the Bible. And that caught my attention. Why? Because up to that point, I thought that Jesus was just a myth, right? He probably did live in the Middle East, and they just exaggerated everything he did, as they do with a lot of people. But when I saw the extra-biblical evidence, in other words, Greek, Jewish, Roman, pagan historians confirming what the Bible says about how Jesus Christ died, that caught my attention. Why? Because my question is, why would somebody go through that? Either you have to be completely insane, or you truly are who you say you are. Now, the cross was not the worst part. The worst part was the Roman beating. Because if you've seen the movie The Passion of Christ, it doesn't even make justice. When the Romans would hit you with those cords, the pieces of flesh would pop out. Most people did not survive the Roman beating. Did you know that? Jesus Christ survived that and then he was crucified. There has been no human being, my loved ones, in the history of humanity that has been tortured like Jesus Christ was tortured on that day. Nobody comes close. Not only was he beaten by the Romans, he was then crucified and dragged that cross to his own death. Now, if he was not who he said he was, as soon as the Romans hit you with that first pe pow, I'm gone, forget about this, I'm not dying for these people. Because nobody would put up with that. If you were, re if you were lying, you're not going to put up with the beating. And he went through it all. That told me something was happening there and not only him but his disciples they were all cowards and after 
the resurrection, they all became martyrs and died. What happened? Christ was resurrected. And then my question was, why, how did Jesus Christ uphold, stand up to the beating that he received? Here's the answer. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Every time that Jesus Christ was punched in his face, every time that they spit at him, every time that they beat him with a stick, every time that they knocked him down, every time that they whipped at him and his flesh was being torn apart with the beating that the Romans gave, every time that he was holding on to that cross and would fall over and they would pick him up again and whip him during the whole way there, every time that a nail were being slammed into his flesh and the crown and being tortured into his skull, it said here, how did he endure? For the joy that was set before him. You know why? He put up with all of that because the father had shown him, son, hold on. Because if you hold on, my son, you will see all of your saved on that glorious day standing on the throne. You will see them. How did Jesus hold all of this? It's because he saw our faces on that glorious day when he returns and all of the resurrected of all of the ages rise up again. That is the joy that made him hold on till the end. Why? Because he wanted to see you and me in his kingdom. Can I hear an amen about that? That was the joy. And that's why it says in Isaiah chapter 53, who despised, he saw what was coming and yet he was relaxed. He was enjoying it. Why? Because he saw our face all standing on the sea of glass, praising and singing honor and glory to the Lamb of God. Amen? Amen? That's what made him go through it, my loved ones, and that's why I say praise God. Amen? Amen? My loved ones, this is just the beginning. We're just dabbling. We're just getting into it, my loved ones. And as you can see, the plan of salvation is fascinating. It's amazing. It's Jesus Christ. He is the plan of salvation, walking us through and showing us everything. Amen? Now, why the sanctuary? Very simple. Why the sanctuary? My loved ones, because the sanctuary is the map to take us back to God. The sanctuary is the map, the road map that God has shown us to, break, to bring us back in reconciliation with him. Look at what it says in Psalm 77, 13. Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. And then it says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Jesus says, I am the way. Where does he want us to go? Does he want us to go to Walmart? Does Jesus want us to go to Cheesecake Factory? He's saying, I am the way. The way where? No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ, my loved ones, through the sanctuary, is showing us the steps that he needed to take first, and then we're going to see that you and I have to take to be able to return back into the presence of God. Amen? Because what is the plan of salvation? That humanity may what? Dwell again with divinity. Amen? Look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous for us the unrighteous. Why? With what purpose? With what reason? So that through him we can be led back to God. Amen? Jesus Christ, my loved ones, is showing us through the sanctuary the way back into the presence of God. Amen? The whole plan of salvation. Now I'm going to say something that's quite controversial. The cross of Calvary is not the plan of salvation. I've had people freak out. What? The cross of Calvary is not the plan of salvation. The cross of Calvary is the beginning of the plan of salvation. It's the foundation upon which this plan is carried out. It's the opening. It's the door that unlocks what? The pathway back into the presence of the Father, my loved ones. Amen? Because the cross is right here in the beginning. It's the first step in the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is that we can be restored once again. And that happens where? Where is the Father in, this in the sanctuary? In the most holy place. So what do we need to do? Christ is not on the cross anymore, my loved ones. He is saying what? Carry your cross and follow me. That means that what do we need to do? We need to continue to follow in his footsteps. Amen? 
And that is the plan of salvation, my loved ones. The whole plan of salvation. And so you're probably sitting here tonight and saying, wait a minute. Nobody has ever explained this to me before. I've been in church my whole life. And no, I, the church I go to, nobody's ever explained this to me before. You know why? Very simple. Why? You've never heard this before. Maybe you've heard a little bit about Jesus as the Lamb and just slightly touched it here and there, but not the way we're going to be studying the in-depth part of this here. Why have you never heard this? There's a very specific reason, and it's in Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. He, talking about the beast of Revelation, opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his... You see, my loved ones, the devil, as we studied yesterday, is using the beast in Revelation... And what has, he do, what has he done with the beast of Revelation? He's been trampling on the plan of salvation, on the sanctuary. Amen? Not amen in a good way. Amen? That that's what's happening. But praise the Lord that we have the Bible. Amen? And so even though the devil is using the beast to cover the sanctuary so that nobody knows. Why do you think the devil doesn't want anybody to know about the sanctuary? Because the sanctuary is going to do what? Reconcile us with God. And so the devil, what does he do? He doesn't want any of us to be saved. So what does he do? He uses the beast to trample on the sanctuary so that nobody knows about this. Praise the Lord, my loved ones. We have the word of God in our hands and we can study and still find the wonderful truths of God. Can I hear an amen about that? My loved ones, that's what we are going to be studying during these two weeks. We're going to be going in depth into the sanctuary. We've just basically started. We're just dabbling with it tonight. But despite that, we can see the wonderful, amazing gift that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The first step in that sanctuary is the altar of sacrifice. And so I'm going to finish with a story tonight, please. Audio, please. This is Florida. Has anybody here lived in Florida? I lived in Florida. Florida is a big swamp, right? Yes, it is. And this is, this is actually, I'm going to tell you a true story. There was this young boy that went to his mother and said, Mom, I want to go out and play with my friends. And Mom said, watch out. So they lived in the panhandle. And she said, watch out, because there's danger in the swamp. Be careful. Yes, Mom. He left. A couple of minutes later, she hears the greatest, the biggest scream that she's ever heard. She saw the scream of her child. You know when your child screams, right? You know it. You can identify it immediately. She knew it. And when she left the house running because she heard her child scream, guess what she saw? She saw a crocodile grabbing her child by the leg and taking him into the swamp to do what? To drown him and eat him. And so what any mother would do, what did she do? She ran and she grabbed that boy by his arms and begun a tug of war between her and the crocodile. She had that boy by his hand. She would not let go back and forth, back and forth. The poor boy is screaming. His leg is in the, in the grasp of this animal. And what happened? A neighbor, praise the Lord, heard. He came out with his shotgun and boom, shot the crocodile. And quickly, they came and they took this boy to the hospital. When the boy was in the hospital, the news reporters, it was a small town. Everybody heard the news. The news went out to the hospital room that night. And the camera guy told the reporter, there's something wrong here. He says, what are you talking about? This young boy just lost his leg and he has the biggest smile on his face. Why is he so happy? I don't know, but let's ask him. So they go into the room and they start asking the boy about the incident. And at the end, the reporter says, I have one more question for you. You have just lost your leg. You're never going to be able to walk normally again. Why are you so happy? What is that smile that you have on his face? And the young boy looked at the reporter, the cameraman, and he said, you know what the real problem is? You're looking at the scars that are on my leg. But what you haven't seen are the scars on my hands and wrists because my mom never let go. My mother never let go. And that's why I'm alive today. And so I praise God. My loved ones, the devil wanted to rip humanity from the hands of God. And what did God do? He put his son in between us. So that what? So that he can carry our burden, our responsibility, and he can live with it. And that's why it says in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 14 and 16, the Lord has forsaken me. He has forgotten me. Maybe you're standing here today. You're sitting here today and you think God doesn't care about you. You think all of the bad things that are happening to you, you're like, where is God? What is God doing? Why doesn't he help me? 
God must not like me. And I know maybe you're thinking about it because I used to think it too. When bad thing after bad thing continued to happen to me. But look at what it says. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? I have a question. Have there been mothers and fathers who have abandoned their children? Have there been mothers and fathers that have killed their own children? God says, well, maybe that happens here on earth, but surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. We do not need to doubt about the love of God because when we look at Jesus Christ, the scars that he carried on our behalf, we know that God truly is a God of love. And he loves you so much that if you would have been the only sinner, Christ would have come for you too. Amen? And when I hear that, I say, praise God. Amen? And so, is there anybody here tonight that wants to say, thank you, Jesus Christ, for giving us that second opportunity and paying us? Stand up today. Stand up tonight if you want to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Amen? Thank you, Jesus Christ, for giving us a second chance. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for dying the death that we are supposed to die and giving us a second chance. But there I'm going to make a call. And what is this call? If you tonight have never in your life before said, Thank you, Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity to come into my life and show me what you want to do for me. Maybe you're sitting here, you've never accepted Christ, you've never given him the chance to enter into your heart, into your home, and you're tired of the battles of life, the pain, the suffering, the burdens, the problems, and you're saying, Lord, I've been running away from you too much. I'm tired of this. I want to give you a chance to come into my heart. I want to give you a chance to come into my home so you can show me what you want to do with me. Is there anybody here tonight, pay attention, that for the first time in their life wants to say, I want to accept Jesus Christ. I want to give him a chance to enter into my life and show me what he wants to do for me. If you are here today and you've never made that decision before to say, Christ, please, I can't anymore. I want to give you a chance. Raise your hand there where you're standing. If you want to say that today, praise the first time. Praise the Lord. Amen. Or maybe you used to be walk with Christ. Maybe you were in his way, with his way. And you, maybe you were in the church, but you stepped aside. You left the church. You gave your back to God and you went out into the world. And now you're coming back and you're saying, I want to restore my relationship with Christ again. I'm calling you too. Amen? Because it's not just for the ones that are doing it for the first time. I'm also calling those that maybe have in the past but have went, walked away from that relationship and tonight want to say, I am officially saying I want to restore my relationship with Jesus Christ. If you fall in one of those two groups, please come forward. I want to pray for you tonight. Please, please come forward. If you're saying tonight for the first time, I, ex I want to give Jesus Christ a chance to come into my life. Or if you're saying, I want to come back into his, harm, into, his, into his arms because I have walked away from that relationship and tonight I want to be reconciled with Christ. If you are here tonight, my conscience would not let me leave without giving you this opportunity to make that great, amazing decision. Amen? Looking at the cross, what else does God have to do to show you how much he loves you? And all he's asking you is for a chance. All he's telling you is, watch. Give me a chance and take a step forward and watch what I can do for you. You see, what happens is we're too, sometimes we like to be spectators in this, in, this, in this game. We like to be sitting out on the stands and notice this, that the victor, the victors are the ones that are playing on the field. We have to take a step and get out from the stands and get on the playing field and say, Christ, I am taking a step forward to you. I want to give you the opportunity to come into my life and into my family so that you can show me the wonderful, amazing things that you want to do next to the things that you have already done for me. Anybody else that wants to join 
this group of people today that have said for the first time in their lives, I'm taking a step forward for Jesus Christ. I want to give him a chance. Or you've walked away from your relationship and now you're saying, I want to come back. I want to give him another chance in my life. Amen? If you are here tonight, I ask you to come forward. I'm just going to pray for you. Amen? Because that is the altar of sacrifice. That is the first step in saying, Christ, I recognize what you have done for me on the cross of Calvary, and I want to begin a walk with you. Anybody else besides these people that are here tonight in front that wants to join us? Praise the Lord. Who says amen for these group of people that are here? Amen. I'm going to kneel down and pray for them. If you would like to join me, please go ahead. If not, you can just stand there and bow your heads where you are. Father, what, what a plan you have for us. The everlasting gospel, the plan of salvation. We have, Father, just begun to touch just the first steps and, and it blows us away. How much you love us. It's not humanly understandable as we, as we study tonight. But despite us not being able to totally grasp and understand how much you love us, we do have a, a small token of that which is actually the biggest token of all, which is your son, Jesus Christ, who gave it all, sitting on the throne next to you, Father. He put his divine garments to the side and he came and dressed himself as a human being with the purpose of giving us a second chance. We are all supposed to be, as Adam and Eve were, supposed to be done away with. No eternal life. But through Jesus Christ, we have been reconciled to you, Father. Through his humanity, we have been reconciled to divinity. And we ask, Father, that you help us every day to understand and to grow deeper into your love. Here's a group of people, fathers, that have come before in front, saying, for the first time, I accept, I accept the gift of Jesus Christ. I want him to come into my life, to sit on the throne of my heart and come into my home. Others have come forth saying that it's a second time. Maybe it's past, it happened in the past. They walked away, but today, while grace is still available, they have returned tonight. And they have said, Father, I want to begin my relationship again with you. There are some, Father, that maybe did not come forth tonight that are stand, standing there or sitting, that their heart is also jumping with joy, knowing and seeing this wonderful gift. And for whatever reason, they have not come forth. Father, you know their hearts. We ask that your spirit be with them also and your angels protect them because they have taken the first step in the plan of salvation, which is looking at Jesus Christ on the cross and saying, I want to walk with Jesus. Thank you for this blessing, Father. Thank you for all of us that have already in the past made that commitment and have main, maintained firmness in this walk so that we can continue to strengthen our walk with Jesus every day and every day fall more and more in love with you. Thank you for this blessing, Father. Thank you for the great gift, the greatest gift ever given which is the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, dying for us to give us a second chance. And we ask and beg all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.